Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. I'm the AI voice of Phoenix. <laughs> Just kidding. If this is your first time here, you've been sitting in the shadows, and you enjoy what you're hearing, please tickle that subscribe button, and don't forget the notification bell. You'll want to set that one to on, so you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. We were in the schoolyard just as school lets out, and massive amounts of kids and people are crowded outside. My brother and I are making our way through. A large woman with blonde curly hair called my brother's name. Hey, M. M from school camp. My brother had never been to summer camp. Come with me. Your, your mom told me to pick you up from school today. Impossible. We only lived a 15 to 20 minute walk from the school, so we walked home after school and took the bus or were driven in the morning. She goes to grab M's hand and instead M grabs mine and goes, come on. And we booked it. Less than a couple months later, another strange woman continually patrolled our street and kept trying to get my brother and I to come and pet her dog, Barney, at the car. The one time, this happened a few times, that my mother came out, she scowled at her like a witch. It's odd to be almost kidnapped once, but possibly twice in a small time frame? The two same boys? I don't know of what would have happened to us had we gotten near that car, but we both do not plan to find out. I was at a mate's house spending the night when I was in middle school. As expected, we stayed up to all hours which didn't matter most of the time, except the bathroom was right near his parents' room. About the only time we'd get into trouble was when someone would wake them up when nature called. To avoid this, we'd go out the basement door and just pee in the woods. The door stayed unlocked most of the time because we'd managed to lock ourselves out more than once. This was also compounded by the fact that we'd all wander out and find something to do in the woods on a regular basis. This night, his older brother was home and kept barging into the basement door and raining chaos from above. So, we decided to lock the door just to deter him. Not that it really would have kept him out, but at least he'd have to use the key, and that took barging in fun out of it. Around midnight, we heard the handle jiggling and didn't think much of it, figuring it was my brother again. After about five minutes of off and on handle fondling, my vocabulary has decided to not function at a high level today. We finally hit the door and yelled for him to stop. Quiet. No response. No more clattering of the handle. Great. We can move on, right? Well, about ten minutes later, it started again, and the process repeated. This went on for about two hours, until finally, after telling him to stop, we just said screw it and ignored it. He continued on for about thirty minutes after our last attempt for him to stop, and then just gave up. Well, 
Fast forward to about 9 a.m. We were just stirring and one of my mates had to go to the bathroom. If you've ever had a sleepover like that, there are bodies strewn wherever there is space. And once the first person starts walking around, it kind of stirs the nest. We all started stretching and making our way to relieve ourselves of all the soda we had binged on the night before. As I go for a walk outside, I grab the door handle to close it behind me and noticed it felt rough. After looking at it, I saw that the space around the keyhole was all but destroyed. There were giant scratch marks on every surface and the metal guides were bent and skewed. I asked my friend that lived there what had happened, and he said it was the first time he'd ever noticed it. Not really wanting to get blamed for something his brother did, we went upstairs and told his parents about the night before. After his dad went down to see what we were talking about, he went completely white and ran upstairs to call the cops. Evidently, someone had been trying to force the lock open while we were all inside. That's actually happened to me more than once on different occasions. What completely freaks me out about this time was that this person knew we were in there and that we knew someone was trying to get in even so to repeatedly try to force his way inside. Long because there's a lot to this story, and I'm also bored and lonely and in quarantine. I'm also a writer, so I tend to be long-winded at times. I went from being a social butterfly in regards to dating to a nearly paranoid hermit. Here's why. I'm 30 years old. I've been on a lot of dates throughout my adulthood, mostly because I enjoy meeting new people and I suppose psychoanalyzing them. That sounds odd, but I did major in psychology for a reason, and I just think humans are fascinating. Of course, there are certain criteria. No hardcore drug users, no creeps. I don't want to go out with someone my mom's age. I could go on, but you get the picture. This has been a positive in many ways. Networking, making new friends, playing matchmaker, gaining insights on dating in general. And sometimes someone surprises me and they are nothing like I imagined. Maybe their photos were bad, or I knew them from work, or a former, or a formal setting, and their personality is markedly different in a casual setting. And honestly, even if it doesn't work out, it's cool when that happens, because it reminds me not to judge people, and to keep an open mind. So I've been on bad first dates. So bad that they make awesome stories and when my friends are depressed. There are awesome little tales I can whip out and make people laugh. When I'm down about being single, I even think about these and have a chuckle. Here is my favorite. Feel free to skip. I am just sharing this because they're funny and you may want to reread these or save these to read last to change your vibe after reading my entire post. Once I went out with a recently honorable discharge marine relocated from another state. We got pulled over in a small town for speeding. He was taken to the station in cuffs because of a speeding ticket that wasn't marked as paid where he was from. He had in fact paid it. He later proved this to me because we dated for a short time afterwards. But the cops at the time wouldn't tell me why he was being arrested. We would joke about it all the time later on. The cops had to give a lift back to my car because I couldn't drive this old truck that was a standard. It was so embarrassing. They gave me a very patriarchal lecture and 
he was freaking out because he liked me and thought I would never talk to him again. He had to walk like four miles back to his truck upon release because he refused the cops' offer for a lift home. He was a true gentleman, very traditional cowboy type. Stetson hat that came off when he ate. Boots and Levi's. White t-shirt and a flannel shirt. Kind of looked like a young Tom Hardy, now that I think of it. Maybe that's why this is my favorite bad first date. Once we went to a river for a picnic, and that same truck got stuck, and we had no cell signal. So we had to hoof it through National Forest for miles to be able to call for help. A mountain lion ended up following us. Thankfully, we had a concealed to carry, a very old-school-looking revolver, and I honestly felt like I was in a Western movie or something. He was very protective and knew exactly what to do. Well, it didn't work out because he took another girl to the same spot and got stuck again. It was an amazing view, though and someone who helped pull his truck out for the second time contacted me and let me know he was two-timing me. In his defense, I sent mixed messages about dating other people and lived a few hours away, and he was probably a little young for me. Anyway, thanks for the stories, Marine Cowboy Tom Hardy doppelganger, but... That is all kid stuff compared to my central story. I was on a dumb dating app, not intending or expecting to go out with anyone from the site because I was happy being single and had just ended a relationship with an emotionally draining person. But, as I prefaced, I am very curious about people and open-minded, and that's what came back to bite me. I agreed to go on a date with a guy who I had a lot of shared interests with. Same ethnic background, Romanian, which is rare around where I live. And we even had the same birthday. He was very into astrology and tarot and esoteric topics in general, including mythology and paganism. What stood out to me was that he was also very science-minded, and while being interested in the aforementioned stuff, also kept a rational, agnostic attitude about it, and approached it more from an academic perspective than a religious one. I was excited because this is rare where I live, in a very religious town. We actually spoke on the phone before we met, which is something I usually insist on to Weed out, weirdos. In hindsight, I realized the first weird thing was after we hung up for the first time. He called me back despite me saying I was going to bed, but I let it go. Maybe he didn't see my text. Fast forward to the first meeting. I asked if he wanted to meet at a very populated local park, and he said yes, but that he wanted to sit by the tennis courts specifically. These are located on the same street, but there are a few houses that separate them from the main park. I thought it was part of the park, but I was wrong. It's actually owned by our local university. This becomes relevant later on. I asked if he was into tennis, and he just said yes. I asked him if he wanted to play tennis, and he said he didn't have any equipment. I figured he just wanted to watch people play tennis or something. It stood out, but wasn't a red flag yet. I got there before him. I watched people play tennis for a while and thought, oh, maybe this is why he wanted to meet here. Whoever got here first would be able to watch tennis and not be bored waiting. He spooked me because he snuck up on me. One second he wasn't there, and the next he was introducing himself. I am very observant of my surroundings. I kept looking for him because he told me which direction he'd be walking from. This was just down the street from his house. And to this day, I don't know how he did it. 
I'm always sneaking up on others, sometimes on purpose, because I'm an asshole, and sometimes on accident. So this shook me, and I was discombobulated. I realized his photos were very bad on his profile. He was a very attractive guy in person, but in his photos, when he would smile in a selfie, it just looked off. I don't smile much in photos, so I wondered if maybe it was because he was the same, but trying to get past it. I don't know how to elaborate any more than that. There was just something distinctly odd about his smile in photos. I didn't notice it in person at all, which made me immediately wonder when we met if I was overly judgmental of people's photos. Hindsight? I'm not. Things start out a little awkward on his part. My style is just say hi. I'm flat little onion dome and start talking like we've met before. Most people love this. I love this. No job interview vibes, just two people hanging out. But there was something markedly different about him in person. On the phone, he was chatty, witty, imaginative, seemed to have passion for life. In person, he made fun of people nearby playing tennis because they weren't following the rules and ended up playing some funny or awkward form of tennis. Volleyball. They were young teens, so I felt he was just being a real asshole. He was obviously checking out other chicks, not just notice people come and go. That's the difference. Condescending about nearly everything I talked about, made some weird comment like he was very frugal. On the phone, he said he spent too much money on travel and books. And his goal for the month was not to spend money on any beverage, but he was still going to drink coffee. I was like, coffee is a beverage. You're cheating. He got legit mad and said coffee is a necessity. And also, he makes it the night before, so it doesn't count for the day. Wait, what? That makes no logical sense. And who wants stale coffee? He also said he is on a very strict diet because he knows exactly what it will look like coming out. I wasn't following and he said, you know, when you shit. At this point, I legit wondered if maybe he had some sort of disorder that would affect social interaction. But as someone who was in the spectrum and has friends and family who are, that just didn't feel right. So I thought, oh well, he's just a jerk and probably trying really hard to appear smart and deep, hence the weird comment. I told him I needed to go back home to check on my ball pythons as I own and breed them. Great way to creep out creepy guys and also I love them. But not before he told me I had an orange-brown aurora. I said that was cool because I love being outside during autumn. He just stared at me blankly. I offered to drive him home. Why, 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 flat little onion dome, did you do that? Face palm. As he had walked. I guess I was kind of nosy about which house he was in. I also wanted to show off my car. Ego here. He said he was surprised I was a professional and not a waitress or something. He worked at a Fazoli's. Literally two minute drive. Parked in front of his house and he asked me out for Thursday. It was Monday by the way. My response was I couldn't for obvious reasons. I could tell he was contemplating inviting me in or kissing me goodbye. He asked me how I felt about a goodbye kiss, and I said I had no feelings one way or the other. Again, dumb. As he was very weird, but he was a good-looking guy. I figured a kiss goodbye for what definitely would be forever wouldn't be horrible. Well, this obviously pissed him off because I was giving him no feedback just to see what would happen. 
and I think he knew that. And he suddenly started telling me how I look different than my photos. All of them are recent, no filters. One was a professional headshot. The rest were just snaps from my iPhone. I asked him how so, because I was genuinely puzzled. He said he was shocked. Someone like me? He referred to me as an intellectual previously, which I'm not sure was meant as a compliment or an insult. Would wear the leggings I had on. They were just plain old leggings with a southern western print. No crazy colors. I must have not reacted the way he wanted because he continued. He also said I looked heavier in person, and he said I also was darker than he thought I was. I am mixed race, ethnicity, Jewish and Native American. And this really pissed me off and made me think he was racist. But I casually said, well, yeah, I've been in the sun the past week and laughed. I also said, that's interesting. Well, good night. He got out of my car and said, I bid you adieu, and not the French kind, but spelt that way. I'm assuming he meant to insult me further from a Freudian implication of not French, as in kissing. Or maybe he was just dumb and I'm reaching. But I replied, if it's spelt that way, it's French, and drove off. And promptly bought a milkshake and a huge order of mozzarella sticks, on the way home, ask some dude friends if I did in fact look bigger in person. I'm ashamed I asked, but the answer was a resounding no and fuck that guy. He was just pissed. He didn't get laid. Now I wish the story ended here, because it would be one I could laugh about in hindsight. Kind of. But maybe not, because I had a nagging feeling about this dude. Something I couldn't pinpoint in my mind's eye. The more I thought about everything in context, his vibe was just so fucking dark. During the date at times. Eye contact with no blinking that weirded me out. Even though I'm usually huge on eye contact. And the nagging that was quite cruel. So I googled his name. And he is on the sex offender registry for soliciting sex from a 13-year-old when he was 23. He's 38 now for context. If that wasn't bad enough, he broke his probation by pleading guilty to stalking and got sent to jail for 120 days. He was a college student when this happened, and the girl was also a college student. I'm sure much younger than him. I have access to a few databases and found court documents. She was a stranger. He stalked her on her route to school and on campus, even on the bus shuttle. And he got kicked out of the university and can't go back on campus ever. I got a message from him the morning after, apologizing, and I responded with, no worries, good luck out there, because I did not want this guy to be angry at me for obvious reasons. I reported him to the dating site and his profile got taken down. He contacted me again and said, if you have an issue with me, you could have just told me. And I played dumb. He believed me and vented about it, admitted to being a sex offender. I pretended to be sympathetic and said I had a family member on the registry for peeing outside. That was a lie, but I do have a cousin who almost got in trouble for peeing outside when kids were around. And then he stopped messaging me. Thank God. I usually would have gone no contact, but my town isn't that big and I did not want to this person to have a grudge against me. I did some research and I found out he couldn't go to the main park because sex offenders aren't allowed to go to parks with playground equipment. Hence the tennis courts, I guess. Also, 
Most people in auras interpret orange as a sexual energy. I think because I don't have revealing photos on dating sites, my big, very non-juvenile boobs probably turned him off, since he likes teenage girls. This is the part where I vomit. I think he's into metaphysical stuff, because it's a community that's very open-minded and probably more willing to forgive his charges. The diet thing was probably because he was in a cell with a toilet, and I'm going to assume in that small of a space, you smell your body waste, for lack of a classier term, for a long time. Can you buy air freshener from commissary? Maybe I should consult with Orange is the New Black. Also, the weird social stuff aligns with antisocial personality disorder, more than autism or Asperger's, according to one of my diagnostic psychology books from college. I am traumatized. I could not stop thinking about it and analyzing this for days and days on end. Literally one of the most normal, sane conversations I've had on the phone predate. Well, dressed and groomed, was very young looking for his age. Ew, he did actually have the same birthday as me, according to his registration page. And shouldn't have any more issues finding dates, but I now know why he is single. If you had told me there is a sex offender messaging you, I would have guessed other people as a possibility over this dude. So, I bought a background check membership and refused to ever meet up with anyone from the internet without doing so. Not that face-to-face -face dating during a pandemic is what I want to do, but even talking on Skype, I want to know. Paranoid? Yes. Peace of mind? Yes. Thankfully, he does not know where I live or my full name. And I had installed a ring security system in my house the day we started talking. And I had mentioned it casually. Long story short, I talked to someone online. I thought he was cool. We talked on the phone and he sounded completely normal and really groovy. Met in person, totally different vibe, totally thrown off. Had a nagging feeling and Googled him and he was a sex offender and a stalker who had served time in prison. I told the dating site they removed his profile. I must have been the only one who went out with him recently because he knew it was me. But I convinced him it wasn't because I was afraid of him. Now, go back and read or reread my funny date story. I want to believe there are more marine cowboys out there than registered sex offender creeps who make and drink coffee incorrectly and are actively online scouting for gullible women. So, I moved into a new place. I'm Indian, and I frequently go to Indian grocery stores. I've been to these stores a couple of times since I moved. I'm short and did something silly during checkout. I was helplessly trying to reach for the divider to separate the groceries and the checkout line. I looked around, hoping nobody noticed, and the cashier guy is smiling at the whole situation. I smile back and try to get done with checkout ASAP. From that day forward, I find this guy trying to grab my attention. He looks at least a decade older than me, quite tall. I find him staring at me quite a lot, walking through the aisles where I'm shopping, just taking glances. This happened twice or thrice, and then he starts walking up to me casually, asking questions like, How are you? He doesn't seem to come to me when I'm with a friend, but when I'm done... I find him lingering around. One day, he just gave me a free snack. I said no, but he handed it over to me and I left. 
The next day, he asks if I had a job and if I'm married. He kind of gets excited when I tell him that I'm a developer and single. He doesn't speak English. He proceeds to say something in Hindi, which I'm not super good at. I try asking him what, and he says something, but I don't understand it. Also, there have been instances where he would step out of the store and watch me while I'm sitting in the car until I left. He just smirks and keeps looking at me. I am a very shy introvert. I am bad at avoiding conversations. I always talk nice regardless of who it is. What should I do now? Does this mean that he is interested in me? How do I politely handle this? He kind of knows who I usually shop with, and I don't want to make it an awkward situation for my friends. Am I overreacting? To clarify, I'm not interested in this person. I always smile and talk. Maybe that's sending him the wrong signals. This is giving me a weird, not-so-good feeling. I could stop going into that store, but that doesn't seem right. The fact that I have to avoid a public space because of a man makes me feel pathetic, and I don't understand in terms of safety. Maybe I can always go with someone there if I have to. Not sure if that's the right thing. Like, it is the only Indian grocery store around. This situation is an inconvenience at this point. I hope anyone that has been through something like this is or are in a better situation with peace definitely makes it awkward to get unwanted attention from random people. Thank you for the ones that commented when I told this story before. I will avoid going into that store for a long time as much as possible. If I do have to go, I'm going to have my friend with me at all times. Being at the grocery store by myself is giving him the opportunity to make advances or create situations where I cannot get away from easily. Here's a quick update. I'm never going back to that store. I had to go today to get a few things for my friend. She had surgery. She didn't want to come along. She is fine to go out. But I dragged her with me. She hadn't noticed that man all these months. I've been going to that store alone for the past couple of weeks. So, he was just openly flirty today. He would avoid approaching me if I was with someone. That wasn't the case today. He was outside of the store when we had reached there. He smiled at us and went inside. Then, stood at the entrance to get a close-up. He leaned towards me and I said, Hi. You know, just like the gesture. Obviously, a lot of people noticed, including my friend. He kept smiling and looking at me all the time. The store manager was there. He didn't seem to bother. After we reached back home, I told my friend that I am never going back there. I asked her if I were overreacting, and she said no. She's the one who told me to ignore him while shopping and wear headphones. Today was subtle because I was with her. He didn't talk much otherwise. He'd be standing in front of me asking personal questions. My friend said that she won't take me there for the longest and decided to go there only if we were a group of three or more with guys from our friend circle. I'm sorry, I'm not a very good person at repeating the past, and this story isn't the best memory to repeat, even though nothing bad happened to me. Don't listen to this if you suffer from trauma due to assault. A little description. The people you might need to know. Kay is 14 in this. She's probably 4'9 at this time and super skinny, just 
fragile. H is 13, around 5 foot 2 at this time, and a little heavy set. I was 13 as well, and around 5 5 at the time. I wasn't skinny, but I wasn't chunky either. I'm guessing these heights because now we are all taller. Not by much, though. I'm going off of my old school trip picture we as well, so please bear with me. When my class was between ages 13 to 14, June of 2018, we were offered the chance to go on an 8th grade field trip to Washington, D.C. with a handful of other schools. It cost around $1,000 per student, but we were all hyped to get the chance to go. I had two close friends at the time. Let's call one girl H and the other one K. K is relatively new to our school and has only gone here for a couple of years at most. But we were all pretty close already, so we all hurried to sign up together for a room and got accepted. So the day of the trip finally comes and it's about a 16 hour bus ride. I sit next to H in the back and K is on a different bus. When we finally get to the hotel we're staying at, it's about midday the next day and we're all sore. H and I got off the bus, got our key card and looked for K. K has her nose in her phone and is texting someone ignoring the rest of the world. I'm pretty loud, so I shout her name, and she finally looks up and smiles at us, wagging her phone in the air. We all get into an elevator together and go up to our room, and we start to get settled in as Kay explains who she was texting. There's this really cute guy on the trip who I used to be friends with before I moved into the school. And he wants to meet up afterwards, so he invited me up to his room. Kay and I just looked at each other, because as much as we loved Kay, she had a knack for messing around with a lot of different boys. But she keeps begging and pleading, and we were still excited to be so far from home acting like adults. So we agreed to go to his room. So the three of us head up a floor towards his room and start walking the long hallway to reach his door. As the three of us stand in front of it, we are all whispering to each other like, You knock. No, no, no you knock. Etc. Finally, I go, All right, I'll knock. And I knocked on the door. First red flag. The guy, Kay, was so desperate to meet opens the door shirtless. He steps back, motions for us to follow him, glaring at H and I. Glaring at H and I, but I could be mistaken. He looks at K and shakes her head, walking away. I go to follow H, telling K, good luck, but she grabs my arm and begs me not to leave her. I was a pretty shy kid and was not used to shirtless, attractive boys, so I sigh and tell her I'll stay. She jokes with me and tells me to go in, and we go back and forth again, and I finally go inside first. I walk in and sit down on the floor in front of the shirtless guy's bed and look up to what they were watching on TV, which was Spongebob. There's another guy in the room on the other bed, but he's not important. Kay nervously walks in behind me and sits on the floor next to me, and it's about five awkward minutes of no talking between anyone as we watch Spongebob. Suddenly, the shirtless guy on the bed reaches down and grabs Kay, pulling her up onto the bed towards him and tickling her. She screams and tries to play it off as a laugh as I rock it up off the floor and turn to run. I'm literally almost out of her reach when she grabs my arm super tightly and digs her nails in. I'll never forget how her eyes looked as she says, Don't leave me. But like a coward that I am, 
I yanked my arm out of her hand and apologized. The creepy dude had his face by her neck and his hands on her upper sides as he smiles up at me and I hear him do okay. Let her leave. I run out of the room and down the hall, trying to call H and get her to come up so we can go together and get Kay out. I'm shaking as I go down the elevator to the ground floor to check for her at the Starbucks, then go upstairs to check our room. I'm on the verge of tears as I leave our room to go check the ground floor again. When I see her come out of the stairwell with a cup of some Starbucks drink in her hand, and she starts to call me. I shout her name and she looks up at me and sees me, and I must have looked some kind of crazy because she rushes over and asks me what's wrong. I explain everything from her as we head towards the elevator to go get Kate. When I finish, she angrily asks me why I left Kay alone with that guy, and I tell her I wanted her help, that I was too afraid to say anything. We run down the hall to that creep's room, and Hope bangs on the door. We pass two other boys as we run down the hall, and the boys stop beside us and ask why we were knocking on their door. We explain that we left our friend inside and we're here to get her back. When those guys light up and say, There's a girl in there? Like a couple of fucking idiots. Creepy boys open the door up, with a shirt on this time, and the boys run past him to look around their room. Creep looks at them as we stare at him, as the other kids stare at us and tell us, there's no girl in here. H and I book it back to the elevator and try calling Kay, going back to our room. We open the door and Kay is sitting on the bed looking at the floor with her hands folded in her lap. H and I hug her and ask if she was okay and she nods and tells us she left shortly after I did. I apologized repeatedly and she tells me it really was okay that she probably would have done the same thing, but I still feel awful because I'm so much bigger and I could have done something to stop it. For the rest of the trip, we call that kid Tickle Me Elmo because of what he did to Kay. After the trip, I told my dad what had happened and he agrees with me that I should not have left her alone. If you girls had been any older, something very bad would have happened. When you go to college, don't ever leave a girl alone with a guy. I wish back then I had the courage to say something, but I was an ugly zit-faced kid with self-image issues. Just know that if I ever run into that guy again, I won't back down, and this time, I'll say what I want to. Almost a year ago, I was fresh out of college and had just moved into an apartment with my middle school bestie and her fiancé. This was after a long period of not seeing her in person. My bestie and I had a long and great relationship with few rocky periods. I didn't know fiancé well, but had met him a couple of times. He came off as kind of rude and loud, but mostly nice enough. I let a lot of little annoying things slide because she was so in love with him. I really just wanted to spend time with my best friend. Over the course of a few months, I slowly discovered that she was trapped in an abusive relationship with the most classic example of a malignant narcissist imaginable. Their fights, really just him raging at her while she cried, escalated to the point when he was completely trashing the apartment, breaking her phone and laptop, hiding her car keys, blocking the door, and grabbing her arm so hard she had bruises. 
all while hurling out the worst insult he could fathom at the top of his lungs for hours. This man is about a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier than me, so there was nothing I could do other than give her a ride somewhere else, away from him, until the next day. He didn't like it when I did that. Once it reached the point of physical harm against her, I put my foot down and demanded that he move out or I would call the cops. He wasn't technically signed onto the lease, so I could have him kicked out. He begged for time to find a new place. He was extremely drunk and high the night he hurt her, and he promised to stay sober until he moved. Not wanting to escalate things, I agreed on the condition that nothing like that ever happened again. My friend and her fiancé broke up soon after that. Three weeks pass and everything is going great. Ex-fiancé has found a new place, is in training for a new job, and while still loud and inconsiderate, he hasn't caused any problems so far. I get ready for bed early. I have an important meeting early in the morning. I put on some comfy pajamas, locking my door before I changed out of habit. My bestie is out working, and it's just me upstairs in bed, and ex-fiance downstairs yelling on the phone about something. I tune him out and try to sleep. He's moving out next week. My chest rattles from the booming footfalls up the stairs to my room, waking me from my sleep. My eyes snap open to see my bedroom doorknob rattling back and forth. Locked. He lets out a yell of pure malice and bangs on my door. He screams my name, and it's so slurred he sounds like he's trying to impersonate a lizard man. The hinges aren't looking so good. We lived in a crappy, cheap apartment with thin doors. I have to do something before he breaks open the door, right? I say the only thing I can think of was, what the fuck? Suddenly, the banging and screaming stops. My doorknob falls still. After a terrifying moment of silence, he says flatly, Open the door, bud. Just come and open the door. I still laugh about that one. Like, after all that, I just walk over and open up the door? Instead, I grabbed my essentials and jumped out the window. I was on the second floor, but we lived on a hill, so the fall wasn't quite that high. Still managed to fall wrong. I hobbled as quickly as I could to my car and peeled out. I called my best friend and warned her not to go home. We made plans for her to stay with a friend after she got off work. I made it to the friend's house and passed out for a few hours. I woke up to a call from my bestie. He traveled all the way to her workplace with a knife and broke in. He assaulted her and held the knife up to her special needs client's throat and said he'd kill them in front of her. Thank God co-workers overheard everything in another room and was able to call the police in time for everyone to come out alive. My bestie also said he was on the phone with her while he was banging on my door and he said he was going to kill me and make her listen. I was totally alone in the apartment with him, sleeping upstairs in my bed. If I hadn't locked my door that night, would I even still be alive? If I had left my car keys downstairs, would I have been able to get away? When I returned to my apartment the next morning, my bedroom door was completely kicked in. My belongings were scattered everywhere and the large butcher knives were missing from the kitchen, instead sitting in the corner of the hallway to my room. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. 
Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Mrs. Innerscare, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for being the pillar of support for Back to Ashes. For without you or the other subscribers or listeners, I would not have a voice. Thank you so much for being my elite members of Back to Ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.